Good morning, Wellspring. It's amazing to see you. Let's all stand and worship our God together. Sing us through these. Come on the clouds. It's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. But every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord this morning. Lord, I just thank you for this beautiful morning, for the gathering of your people, Lord. I just pray that you would prepare all of our hearts to receive what you have for us. As we worship you, Lord, we pray that you would be glorified and that our hearts would be prepared to hear your word, to receive it, Lord, to walk in light of it, God. We see a dying world around us, and Lord, we, we desire for them to be saved. And Lord, we just recognize that one day it'll all be over. They will all bow down to you. They will all confess that you are God. You will reign over with your people forever and ever, Lord. We just thank you. Thank you for that amazing truth that you are coming again in power to take everything that belongs to you. And that is all things, Lord. We just thank you. It's what we celebrate today, that you have defeated death. And one day, it will, sin will be done with forever. And we love you and we worship you for that. We ask these things in your name. And everybody said, amen. Let's take some time and greet each other this morning. Shadow of turning with me, thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not as thou.
summer and winter. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest. Sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature. My sorrow, alone in my sorrow, and dead in my sin, lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested. My life began, ash was redeemed. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart 
was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace. Oh, your grace. So free. Washes over. Rejoices though heaven had lied. But then Jesus arose with our freedom. song that'll be new to a lot of you. Just sing it as you know. The stars burn down. When the stars burn down and the earth wears out and we stand before the throne with the witnesses 
who have gone before, we will rise and all applaud, singing blessing and honor and glory and power forever to our God, singing blessing and honor and glory and power forever to our God. In the hands of time, when the hands of time wind fully down, in the earth is rolled up like a scroll. The trumpets will call and the world will fall to its knees as we all go home. Singing blessing and honor, glory and power forever to our God. Singing blessing and honor, glory and power forever. In a moment, we'll be like Him. He will wipe our eyes dry, take us up to His side, and forever we will be His. Singing blessing and honor, glory and power, forever to Heavenly Father, we love singing these truths pulled straight from your word, God. And yet it's difficult for us to truly understand what that day will be like, the revelation of Christ. Just pray that you'd be with us now as we open your word, that we would rightly apply these words, God. If you tell us to be prepared, who will you find still prepared at the day of his coming? Lord, I just pray that we would be those people who are ready, who are prepared, who have been waiting for the return of Christ faithfully, Lord. We would be found faithful wherever we are in life. Whenever you come, Lord, or we pass and we meet you face to face, Lord, that we would have been ready. So, Lord, as we dive into your word, I pray that you would just work on us, work in our hearts to believe these things, to contextualize these things that we read, Lord, these truths that are so much bigger than us, God. Just be with us, and by your spirit, Lord, we trust that you will apply these truths to your people, that we would grow in faithfulness, sanctification, Lord, and purity as we hear these things and we desire to be ready for the day that you come, that glorious, glorious day where you come for your people and all is said and done. 
Lord, we ask these things. We ask for your help, Lord, and we just worship you now as we open your word and we, we read about you and your coming, your coming in power, Lord. We worship you. Be glorified this morning, Lord, by our praises and by our willingness to listen, Lord. Just by your spirit, apply all of this to us, God. We need your help. So be with us. We ask these things in your name. And everybody said, amen. You may have a seat. Well, good morning, church. I would like for you to open your Bibles to Matthew 24. Uh, Matthew 24, we're going to be in verses 15 through 31 as we continue along this all of that discourse, the teachings that Jesus gave to his followers on the Mount of Olives. And, and it all roots back to that question that the disciples asked back in Matthew 24, 3. The disciples asked Jesus, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Uh, and as we were just singing, and glory and power to our God who is coming, amen? We look at the world that we live in and, and we realize that days are growing darker, hearts are growing colder, but all the glory and all the power, all the majesty is still to our God forever and ever, amen, and he is coming again. So in Matthew 24, verses 15 through 31, we're going to be looking at more of this. Let's begin with prayer. Father God, we do ask as we come to your word. It is holy that you have left for us, given to us, preserved for us, that we can learn from it, that we can be corrected by it, that we are drawn to you. If you will open our hearts, and Holy Spirit, if you will uh, interpret it for us rightly, it will draw us to you, Lord Jesus, for the only means of salvation is you, whom is declared through this word. So Lord, draw us near to you, I ask. Open our hearts to, to know, our ears to hear. Lord, just uh, pray that you would just speak to us and that we would see uh, with, great, with great concern the nature of the world that we live in and with great urgency what we must do in the days that are left to us to glorify you and to call as many as might be spared from the fire, to be a part of what you are doing in the world, to preach these truths to those that we have influence over, to preach these truths to any who will hear the Holy Spirit, you will work in their lives, we ask. Be here and work through these, these things today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, again, they ask this important question. And it's not like this is a new question. People have been asking for a long time, when is the end going to come? I mean, we've all seen that guy with the cardboard sign on the street corner, right? The end is near. Just remember, every day he's a little more right. And so we want to know, well, when are these things going to come? And so they, they asked this important question, well, when are these things going to come? And his answer was to caution them and to warn them, you need to be ready. You need to be ready for when the end comes. Don't worry so much about when it's going to come. Be ready for when it does. Be ready because many are going to come seeking to mislead you. Many are going to come trying to take you into, into, into false teachings. And so you need to endure to the end. He said there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, but that won't be the end. He said nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there's going to be famines and earthquakes and natural disasters. That won't be the end. In fact, he said that's just the beginning. He said the faithful followers, those who are following the way of Jesus Christ, he said they're going to be hated by those who are following the way of the world. They're going to be persecuted. The faithful persecuted, prosecuted, even unto death. They will be betrayed, even by those whom they thought were brothers and sisters in Christ. Many will fall away, he said, turning to follow the world because they feel the cost is just too high. And even that won't be the end. He tells them the cause of all of these things is because hearts have grown cold. People have been, well, I mean, there's going to be a lot of love in the world. There's a lot of love in the world now, but as country singer Johnny Lee sang, they're looking for love in all the wrong places. We have one person that we should be seeking our love from as we seek to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, as we seek to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. But in those end times, love of self will be the love of the world, the love in immoral relationships, the love that is cold and dead. It's not a love at all, but it's pride masquerading as love. And in those days, the Lord said in uh, Matthew 24, 13, he said, endure, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. That is to endure and stand firm through sufferings, endure, endure, and preach the gospel, he said. 
When does the light shine the brightest? When it is the darkest outside. And dark days are coming. Dark days are here, don't get me wrong. But far darker days are coming. And we are to be the light in the world. To preach the gospel of the kingdom to the whole world, to every nation, tongue, and tribe. Because he says that that will be the witness, Matthew 24, 14. The gospel, the truth of the kingdom, that is going to be the witness against those who are following the way of the world. And when this is accomplished, he says, then, then the end will come. So today we're going to continue on with this discourse as we pick up in Matthew 24, verses 15 through 31. The Lord went on to say, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things out of, that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be such a great tribulation, such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then, if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he's in the inner rooms. Do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Hardly even needs explanation. Pretty self-explanatory, right? We get an image uh, of what these end times are going to look like. We, we have a study of this. This whole study of the end times is called this, the study of eschatology, the study of end times. And we look to God's word to find what those end times are going to look like. And specifically, even in these verses, these help us to understand and to define what those end days are going to look like. As Jesus goes through this, uh, he relies heavily on the prophets of the past, Joel, Daniel, Ezekiel, and Isaiah, but he also gives his own proclamations, new understandings, and insights into what those days are going to look like. And we use all of these, again, to, to help to develop our understanding of eschatology, our understanding of the end times. And yet there is so much of it that is still a mystery to us. Scholars have been studying these words for thousands of years, and there's still so much of it that is mysterious to us. But we glean truth from God's Word. First of all, we see it's going to be an amazing and miraculous and marvelous time. It's also going to be a horrific time. It's also going to be a time that's going to end with the coming of our Lord. These things are certain and true. We see references to this teaching scattered throughout the New Testament. We find uh, portions of these teachings in all the Gospels and the writings of the, of the disciples that went afterward. And of course, we find a lot of this also in that final book, the book of Revelation, which is in the back of your Bibles for a reason, because every good scholar knows that the answers are in the back of the book, right? So when we go to Revelation, we see so many of the answers revealed to us about these end times. But before the end of Revelation, which ends with the end times, as you might imagine, I want you to consider the first part of Revelation and what we are to do with this. Uh, from the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. John, writing from the Isle of Patmos as he was imprisoned, he writes this, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's, there's the punchline. That's the whole book of Revelation. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is all about him and this coming. He said, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants 
the things which must soon take place, and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Now here's, our, here's this, verse 3. I want you to pick up on this. John tells us this. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Blessed is he who reads these things, these, these prophecies about these end times, who, who reads it, who hears it, but most importantly, who heeds these things. Those who, who, who understand these things, and they pay attention to the warnings, and they apply these things. Blessed is the one who does these things. Why? Because the end is near. I told you, that guy's cardboard signs, getting writer every day. Christ our Lord, as he, as, he, as he takes all these truths and he applies them to his disciples in his day, is telling us in our own that we need to endure and preach the message of the gospel. Therefore, we must be obedient. If, we, if we're truly obeying God, and if we're truly following the ways of the Lord, then we have been grafted into this vine, right? And if we've been grafted into the vine, then we have to be producing fruit that honors the vine that we are a part of. We have to have good works that are a part of our lives. And we, we, we look at the way that we're living our lives and we ask ourselves, the works of my life, are they really glorifying Christ? Is this one of those, those, those templates that I throw out there for myself as I'm trying to make a decision on how I should respond in a certain way on a certain day is to ask myself, is this going to honor God or not? And we should have works in our lives that, obey, that are, are rightly glorifying God. And why, why is that so important as we talk about the end times? Well, how many here, just a quick poll, how many here would like to do good with their life? Okay, how many here want to do evil with their life? Elders, are you looking around? Okay, good, all right. So we want to do good with our life, that's great. How many days do you have left to do good with your life? Who knows, right? Anybody here guaranteed of making it home from church today? Every day is a blessing, amen? This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Because this is today. This is what I have. And he says the end is near, so we must not waste the days that are coming because these days are coming to an end. Therefore, he tells them, Matthew 24, 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. So as we break this down, a couple things we understand is we need to understand, as he says, let the reader understand. One of the key things I want you to understand here is that all of this scripture was not written to America. <gasps> we are not the most important thing on God's mind. <gasps> we have this, 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 this perspective, I think. Uh, where we look at these things, we go, well, how does that, all this affect America? America the great. Well, the answer is not. We need to have a kingdom view of Scripture. The Word is written about God to reveal Christ and man's sinfulness that man might, his heart might be open to receive the truth of God that he might, by the grace of God, be spared. It's not about America. And specifically, when we look at different areas of Scripture, we see that there are areas that are very pertinent to a particular group of people in a, in a particular time. And that is the case with this passage. This passage is very clearly written to a specific group of people in a specific time. The timing is this. So understand this. Therefore, when the timing of these things, when these things occur, when the abomination of desolation sets himself up in the holy place, that's the when then those living at that time. So this is specifically written to those living in those days. This is, a, this is a, a word of warning and encouragement for them that they should heed these instructions. And I want you to imagine for just a moment that we were living in those days and that these signs and wonders were being poured out on the world in our day. We would be a church in hiding. These lights would be off. Our doors would be locked, and we would just be hoping that the police of the world, the police state of the, of the heart of the world, didn't find us out here, because if they did, we would be arrested, we'd be persecuted, we'd be prosecuted. And certainly, the guy standing up here would be put to death. Brian, it's your turn. <laughs> There's a reason why Brian asked if I would preach this section. I just know it. No, I mean, the bolder you are in those days, proclaiming the good news, the more the world will persecute you and prosecute you even unto death. 
And yet, because we are so convinced of the truth and the value of knowing God, we have gathered here today to know these truths, share these truths, and understand these truths. Is that why you're here today? Because the world out there doesn't love you. The people out there don't love you. And especially when we go out there and we share these hard truths with them, they don't love us for that. Amen? So we need to have that same attitude in and of ourselves even today that we see the value of knowing the Lord and trusting in his word and gathering together in corporate fellowship as exceeding the dangers that might come our way from the world as it hates us for these things. Understand that this abomination of desolation, when he comes, will desecrate the temple. Now, as far as the temple being desecrated, this is not a new event. This has occurred in the past. In 168 BC, the Greek king Antiochus Aphanus, uh, as he was sweeping through the lands, he uh, fought against and conquered Jerusalem. He fought against, uh, against the Egyptians. As he held Jerusalem, he went in and he set himself up in the temple. He offered sacrifice of swine, pigs, on the altar in Jerusalem. He declared that he was as God in the temple. I made uh, sacrifices to Zeus in the temple. But even that wasn't the last time that the temple's been desecrated. As Jesus foretold in 70 AD, the Romans would come through in response to the Jewish zealots of the day, and they would destroy the temple and plant the flag of Rome uh, in the place where the temple stood. The Jewish historian Josephus records that there were well over a million Jewish lives lost in those days, that the siege on Jerusalem was so severe that people resulted to cannibalism in some instances, and that after the siege, 100,000 Jews or more were forced into slavery. And yet all of those things are but preludes to the days that Jesus is talking about here because none of those fully fulfill what Jesus is talking about and the descriptions that he and the other prophets give us. This abomination of desolation is spoken of uh, in many passages, but I'm going to look at it from Daniel 9, 11, and 12 as he foretells the time of this one, this abomination of desolation, this one who will come and desecrate the temple. In Daniel 9, 27, he says, And he, this one who will come, shall make a strong covenant with the many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to the sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who will make desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Oh, there's this prince of peace who is coming. But it's a false peace. As he makes peace with the warring factions of the nations of the world, but it's a false peace that he himself will break the covenant with even those whom he has made peace with. In Daniel 11, 31, we read this. It says, And they will set up the abomination of desolation, and by smooth words he will turn to godlessness those who act wickedly toward the covenant. This is his whole purpose, is to turn people from God and from God's covenants, from God's truth. In Daniel 12, 11, it says, And at that time, from the regular burnt offering, it will be taken away, And the abomination that makes desolation is set up there, and his days shall be 1,290 days. It's common understanding as we look at these passages and and so many other passages about the end times that that tribulation period, that time of trials and troubles, will last seven years. And it is broken into two halves, the tribulation in in the forefront and then the great tribulation that comes after this midpoint when the abomination of desolation sets himself up in that holy place. It's a time of judgment. It's a time when God's wrath is poured out because of his holiness, where he demands that judgment be poured out on those who have rejected him. But it's also a time of great mercy and grace where God is working to call all who, even in those days, might come to know him as Lord, will call out, will repent, and be saved by their faith. Within these revelations is given the the, the understanding of this one, this this spearhead person, the tip of the evil spear, if you will, and he will be an anti-Christ. He will be one who will come, who will oppose Jesus Christ, the Christ of the Lord, in all ways that he can, and will oppose all that he accomplished, and he will manifest himself in signs and wonders to imitate Christ, because that's all he can do, is imitate. He can never be as, so all he can do is be like. And at the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation to come, he will set himself up in the temple and declare himself to be God and demand that the people of the world worship him. And the saddest thing of all of that, as ridiculous as that sounds to us, is as we will read, the world willingly goes after him. We can see at least six things in Scripture about this Antichrist. Number one, he claims to be God and is worshipped. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 through 4. 
Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And yet we see this message in the world even today, as people are going around talking about how God is man, and you are, you are God, everything that you want, everything you desire, you know, that the mankind is, assumes the totality of God. These lies as Satan, again, seeks to mislead as many as he possibly can. Number two, he will blaspheme God, Revelation 13, 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Number three, he will display miraculous powers, Revelation 13, 13. He performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. So it's not just going to be this simple, well, he's a charlatan. No, there's going to be signs and wonders that God will permit him to perform so as to mislead any who are not firmly rooted in the truth. The Antichrist will imitate even the resurrection of Jesus, Revelation 13, 14. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So even trying to imitate Christ's resurrection, there is this wounding that occurs and this healing that occurs. But even notice the words here. He is wounded. Christ was not wounded. Christ died. Christ died on the cross, and it says that this authority that was given him, that he was allowed to, to heal himself, but Christ alone stands as the only one who by his own authority laid down his life and took it up again. There has been none and will never be any who will accomplish what Christ has accomplished, for he is the Lord. The Antichrist is allowed to rule with authority, Revelations 13, 5, and 7. For three and a half years, it says that he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. But even here, notice that it's authority that he has. Every tribe, nation, tongue will follow after him, those of the world. But even that authority is given to him by God. He has no authority and power of himself except that which is allowed by God. The Antichrist will control the world's economy. You want to control the nation? Control their wallet. You want to control the people? Control their wealth. Revelation 13, 16 says, He forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. You know, people read these things, these prophecies, generations past. They go, how ridiculous is that? That could never occur. How would that ever really you know, be accomplished? How could, a, how could a government, how could a person have complete control over everybody's money to, to, so that, to, to control whether you could or couldn't buy anything? How many of us today are walking around with a credit card with a little chip in it? You know, the, the thing is, we look at what God is saying, and I'm not saying that those are evil, but what I'm pointing out is that the world is moving toward a period where the things that generations ago seemed like how could that ever be? We're going, well, I can totally see how that could be. And it tells us that we are moving in a direction toward the end of days. Matthew 24, verses 16 through 22. Sets our time again. When the Antichrist comes to power, the Lord says, when these things happen, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in the house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Again, the win the where, and the who. As we look at the, at the text that we're speaking and looking at here, it speaks specifically of a time that is when the abomination of desolation comes, when the Antichrist comes, when he comes in his power and his authority. It speaks about the location, Judea. It even mentions the Sabbath period here. And so we see very specifically that Jesus is speaking to who? The Jews. He's speaking to the Jews living in those days in that place. This is a very specific instruction for them. And again, we're looking at this as American Christians and going, well, that doesn't really affect me. Yes, it does. 
It all affects us because it is the Word of God. But understand specifically what, we, what we're to do with these things in our day. Again, imagine being now a Jew in Jerusalem, in Judea, when these things are occurring, and you are desperately seeking something. Everything is lost. Everything is, is, is ruined. Everything is coming to an end. What can we possibly to, do for those who turn to the Word of God? They're going to find what? This. They're going to find this instruction and this teaching to encourage them and to lead them and to guide them. How many here pray for Israel? What do you pray for Israel? How many here are praying for Israel's safety? How many here are praying for Israel to repent? Remember, the nation of Israel that, that, we're, that we're watching in the news right now with everything that's going on to them, by and large, is a nation who has not accepted Jesus Christ of Nazareth as Messiah. Our prayers, yes, pray for, for safety. I'm, I, I'm, I'm totally good with that. But our primary prayer for Israel needs to be that they repent, that they come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and God. In these days, he tells them that they must flee the persecution against the Jews. Gentile, or I mean, follower of Christ or not, just, just the, the persecution against the Jewish nation is going to be so severe that he tells them to flee with urgency. Don't go down and get your cloak. Don't, don't turn around and look back. Just flee to the mountains. It's very reminiscent of the, of the, uh, the lesson we have from Lot in Genesis 19, verses 15 and 17, as Lot and his family were called out of, out of uh, so Sodom before the Lord brought judgment on that city. Genesis 19, 15 says, When morning dawned, the angel urged Lot. He said, Take up your wife, your two daughters who are with you, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. And when they had brought them outside, verse 17, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you. Do not stay anywhere in the surrounding area. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away, again, by the judgment of God. Very similar writing to what we're seeing here because it can be a very similar circumstances. Why did God bring his wrath, pour out his judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah? Because of their sin, because of their immorality, because of their rejection of God. Friends, look at the world we live in. It is the mercy of God, the grace of God that is holding back that cup of wrath from being poured out in the world in these days. Amen? We are so far down that path, so much further than Sodom and Gomorrah ever had thought of being. And it is but for his grace and mercy that he has not poured out that cup yet. But it will be poured out one day. He tells those people living in those days to flee, to flee from the cities because the wrath of God is going to be poured out. He says the second half of that tribulation is a great tribulation. It's far worse than anything that has ever come on the earth or ever will come on the earth. It will be the final tribulations. God's going to pour these out in three phases and seven judgments. We see the seven seal judgments talked about in the book of Revelation. I was going to insert a, a parenthetical note here about teaching the book of Revelation. I know that the Oasis group has just recently gone through it. Uh, the last time I taught through it, it took about 18 months. Uh, I encourage you, though, if you have an opportunity to do an in-depth study of these end days through the book of Revelation, it will, it will change your perspectives. Seven seal judgments are poured out. Antichrist uh, is revealed. Wars, famines, death, martyrs, and earthquakes that lead to the seven trumpet judgments where a third of the vegetation is burned, a third of the seas are turned to blood, a third of the fresh water is made bitter, a third of the sun, moon, and stars are darkened, much in the same way as our Lord is speaking in our passage today. Demonic activity is increased, and a third of mankind is, it dies off. Seven bold judgments follow these things, where mankind is plagued with sores, all the life in the seas dies, all the fresh waters become as blood, the scorching heat from the sun that burns the flesh of mankind, there's darkness upon the kingdom of the beast, the Euphrates dries up, the armies of man assemble, and then there is widespread destruction of the lands and the kingdoms of the beast. This destruction is so severe so total, so complete, the Lord says that unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. God will preserve that remnant. There will always be those in every age who come to know the Lord and trust in him. 
And even in those days, we see that God is working. Even with all the calamities that are coming and all the destruction, the death and the plagues and everything that's going on, God is still working to offer salvation to those who will call upon the name of the Lord. In chapter 7, uh, or chapters 1 through 3, read, rather, we read about these seven churches. He writes this letter to seven different churches, which are named, but in our day we understand them to be seven types of churches. And he asks in these churches, he points out, he says, this you're doing well, but this I have against you. You need to do this or I'm going to do that. And these are the kinds of warnings that churches, even ours, uh, as we, we look through these things, okay, okay, well, what were they doing well? We should be doing that well. What were they not doing well? We should be avoiding those things. So we can, we can bless the Lord by serving him rightly. But for those who didn't, there were judgments that were coming. He finished each one of those letters to the churches with this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. God's warning churches. He's warning the lukewarm church. He's warning the church that is not, that is not presenting the truth to the world. He's not teaching the truth from its stages, and he's warning them. Heed these warnings. It's a time during that tribulation period where God, through uh, chapter 7 in Revelation, reads of 144,000 people that he's going to protect. He's going to put his, his mark on these people to protect them, 12,000, each from one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And they will go out, and they will lead others to Christ in those times. And even with all that that's going on... He, uh, in the midpoint, or a little after that, we got chapter 11 of Revelation, where he introduces these two witnesses that are going to come. These two men that are going to appear on the scene and witness and prophesy with power and authority and signs and wonders. And yet the world still will not believe. Even with all the bold judgments that are going on, all the destruction that's going on around the world, even with everything that's happening, it says in uh, six, Revelation 16, 9 and 11, it says they did not, the people of the world would not repent and give to God glory. In fact, in Revelation 16, 11, it says they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain and sores. Oh, it's so miserable, it's so hard, the world's so tough, God's at fault. We hear that today. People are out there blaming God today for all the problems. Oh, it's all God's fault. We love to take the blame of our own transgressions against God, the judgment that comes on us, the people of the world, we may not say us per se, but nobody, who here likes to be at fault? I mean, parents, right? I mean, what, what was the number one? You go to your kids, like, okay, who knocked over the coffee table? And the answer is, not me. Right? I mean, that, we, 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 we ingrain that into kids at a very young age, it seems like. They, they pick up on this, you know, the, the shift that blame to somebody else, not me. But people in the world are the same way. The sin that they have in their life is bringing about the consequences of their sin in their life. He goes, well, it's not my fault. It's the world's fault, it's society's fault, ah, it's God's fault. No, it is yours. It is yours. And yet these people, even in their day of pain and suffering, will curse God rather than turn to God that they might be saved. And all those in those days are warned. And because of their desperation, they're going to be reaching out for, for, for means of salvation, if you will. And so in Matthew 24, verses 23 through 28, we get this warning. The Lord says to them in Matthew 24, 23, then if anyone says to you, you who are living in those days, you who are hiding in these days from the wrath of God that's being poured out on mankind, if you hear someone say, behold, here's the Christ, or there he is, don't believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise, and they will show great signs and wonders. For what purpose? To mislead. To mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I've told you in advance. So if they say, behold, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. Behold, if he's in the inner rooms, don't believe him. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So there's a broader understanding. Well, yes, specifically, this is speaking to those living in those days in that place. There will be people in other nations that are enduring these tough times as well. And, and Satan's goal is not just to mislead the Jews. He is to mislead as many as he might. And so this is a teaching for us as well regarding false prophets, false Christs. That everyone who calls on the name of the Lord in those days, because there will be people who in their desperation will be seeking some form of salvation. And so these false Christs are going to show up. Satan's not dumb. He's been planning this for a long, long time. And so in their pain and their suffering, their desperation, they're like, oh, we need hope. And there will be these false 
messiahs, these false Christs who will come forth, these false prophets preaching false messages of hope, and people will grab onto those things because they're desperate for hope. And the trick here is, the, the warning here is, is to make sure that the one to whom you cling is the true Christ. Clinging to a false Christ will not save you from God's wrath. Why? Why is all this happening? Because Satan is, is reaching out to deceive and to mislead, uh, to lead astray as many as he possibly can, prowling like a lion. It's not just haphazard. He is devious in this plan and wise and cunning in his ways to lead people away from the Lord. Understand this truth. I, I, it, it bugs me to no end when I see you know, the little t- the templates and the message go out there about Satan being in hell with his little fork and horns, his pitchfork, and, and he's in hell and he's ruling over hell. Friends, two, two things. Thing one, Satan isn't in hell. Satan isn't in hell. Job 2.2, 2, the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and he said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. Revelation 12.9, speaking of the fall of Satan, it said the great dragon Uh, was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was hurled to the earth and the angels with him that followed him. Satan isn't in hell. Satan is here along with his demons. And when we live in this privileged time, when we look around, we go, well, I don't see. I mean, I read the Bible and I see all these things about Satan doing. I don't see those things. Are you sure? As we look at the wickedness and the, the world around us, are you sure that you're not seeing Satan and his demons work? Or are we just explaining it away? Because we've gotten so comfortable with these things. Are we giving them diagnoses and calling them medical conditions or mental conditions? And are we treating Satan with, medical, with, with medicines? Take heart. There will come a day when Satan will be cast into that fiery pit. But he will not be cast there to rule over hell. He will be a prisoner in it. Revelation 20.10, the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they were tormented day and night forever and ever. That's what Satan is doing in hell. But that day is coming. It has not come yet. And so until then, the faithful are commanded to endure, to be ready, not to be misled. That word misled is the Greek word paneo, which means to cause to wander. I don't know if that's big enough for you all to see. Hopefully it is for those at home. But I want you, I want you to understand what, what is Satan doing here? What, what is his primary goal? And his goal is to cause the image bearers of, of God to wander. We are created in the image of God to glorify God. This is our whole purpose, right? To glorify God. And so Satan's purpose is to cause you to be misled, to wander from glorifying God, to wander from your trust of God's word, to wander your trust or your love rather for God, your acts of worship to God, and to cause you to wander from your faith in God. And he does this in so many different ways, reaching into people's lives, whispering in their ears, sending out false messiahs, false Christs who will proclaim a way of salvation, but it will not be the way of salvation. Therefore, there is one way, amen? And he is the truth, the way and the life. No man comes to the Father except through Christ, the Christ of the Scriptures. There are going to be those who come who are a false Jesus. We have other writings in the New Testament that warn about these Christs that come who are not the Christ that we've been taught of the Scriptures, and their purpose is to mislead others. And there will be false prophets who will come, and they will spread lies and water down truths that, again, are there to cause people to wander and to doubt and to leave their first love and to not follow and honor God rightly. It's serious, guys. We're seeing it in the world already. It is going to become tenfold worse as we approach the end times. Jumping down just a little bit in my notes here. Yes, Satan, his desire is to mislead mankind, to cause you to wander, and his strongest weapon against you is doubt, to cause you to doubt. Throughout Scripture, when we look, we see that salvation has been by grace through faith. When we come to the examples in Hebrews 11 of all those patriarchs, and it was accredited to them as righteousness. What was accredited to them as righteousness? That they believed God, that they did not doubt God, that they trusted God, that they had faith in God. 
It is to those who believe and trust and submit to God and who obey him that we see his blessing poured out into their life. From the beginning, from the very beginning, this was the message and this was the, the methodology of Satan. As he approached Eve in Genesis 3.1 and said, Yea, hath God said? Because it's just more powerful in the King James Version. Yea, hath God said? Questioning, did, did God really say that? This, this is one of his go-to motives as Satan wants you to look at this word and go, well, I don't, did God really say that or did God really mean that or does that really mean this or that? God, Satan loves it when we question the truth of God. And he goes in and he encourages mankind to question God, challenging us to doubt the word of God. And this is going to get worse and worse as we approach these end times. It's going to get so bad, guys, that there's going to be people out there that are willing to find leaders, preachers, pastors, and put them up there on the stages and go to seminars and hear men of God who will tell them not what they need to hear, but what they want to hear. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 through 4. The whole passage is 1 through 6. But starting in verses 3 through 4, hear this. For the time is coming... Paul teaches young Timothy, he says, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. We're seeing this in the world already, where we've got churches out there that teach these lukewarm, Jesus loves me messages without ever getting to the hard truths of God's word. And, they, and people are seeking these, these, these Jesus loves me mentalities. Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so is wonderful for our little kids, but we need to be raising them up beyond that, amen? Maturing them into mature children, mature followers of Jesus Christ who can stand on their own because of what they know about God. Ticklers of the ears that people are looking for. They want to hear people that say things like, well, raise a hand and say these words and you'll go to heaven. Truth is in the heart of a person, so believe in yourself and God will love you for who you are. God is love and loves everyone, regardless of what gender you claim or what sex you fall in love with. As long as you ask God to forgive your daily sins, you're okay. That whole repent thing is just meant to make you not be a bad person. God exists in many forms and all manners of beliefs and religions, so it doesn't matter how you believe. God doesn't punish people by sending them to hell. That's just a scare tactic used by some to control others. And God's karma surrounds us all and makes us whole. Oh. It's lies, people. It's not found in the Word of God. It's not what God teaches us about who He is and what it means to follow Him. As for us, may we cling to the rest of that passage, 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 and verse 5. He says, I charge you in the presence of God. I'm convicting, I, church, hear this. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearance and His kingdom, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. He says, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Guys, I pray that this, is, that this would become how we do things here at this church. And I see that our desire to move that way from leadership and within people in the church to fulfill that, that, that mission statement we've got to love Jesus, reach the lost, and build the church. Let's be about that in the days that we have left to us. Now, I know we say yes and amen, but understand that in these last days, it's going to get hard. It's going to get complicated. We know that Revelation 13, 8 tells us all who dwell on the earth will worship him, this false God who's coming, this false Messiah that's coming, this false prophet that's coming, everyone whose name was not written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Those whose names have not been eternally secured will follow after these false teachers and preachers. Joel tells us, and Peter talks about it in Acts chapter 2 also. He said, in those last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Don't forget, there's going to be signs and wonders that God is working in these days, and these false prophets are going to be working in these days. It's going to get very confusing for people out there who are not firmly rooted in the word of God, because these false messages are going to sound good. They're going to be what people want to hear. Sometimes the word of God isn't what we want to hear, it's what we need to hear. Amen? But that's not going to be the message of the world. The world is going to tell people what they want to hear. It's okay, you're okay, it's all going to be all right. Not if you're not rightly following God, it won't be. 
And we need to be bold enough, loving enough to tell people that truth. When these false prophets come, these false Christs come, the Lord says, don't believe them. Don't believe them. Know what you know and how you know it. Behold, the Lord says in Matthew 24, 25, I've told you in advance. Why did God tell us these things in advance? Why not just leave this all up to one big surprise? Surprise, false prophets. Oh, you didn't see that coming, sorry. Why is God telling us these things? So we can be ready. So we can be ready. So we can know that we need to be studying the truth of God's word. So when the falsehoods of these things come about, we can recognize them for being the lies that they are. When Christ comes, here's here's my promise, okay? If we're living in those days and Christ comes, you're going to know it. You're going to know it. Matthew 24, 27, he says, Just as lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to be sudden, it's going to be obvious, it's going to be predictable. Friends, we're going to see it coming. Matthew 24, 29 through 31 says, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the powers of heaven will be shaken, the signs of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from from one end of the sky to the other. When he comes, it's going to be obvious. Dropping down in my notes some here, I want to talk about uh, how how we apply these things. How do we apply these things to the world that we live in today? The question to us is this. What are we going to do with these truths today? What will we do with these truths today? The question of the disciples was this. When will these things happen? And his answer to them was this. We need to be less focused on the signs of the wind And we need to be more focused on being ready for the win. It's going to happen. That's a done deal. We know that these things are coming. So number one, uh, and this should be uh, slide 10. We're right down at the end there. Number one, we need to be ready. That is, we need to be prepared. In Matthew 24, 4, the first response of the Lord was this. See to it that no one misleads you. Do not be led to wander, people. And the best way not to be led to wander is to know what the truth is. In Matthew 24, 4, again, see to it that no one misleads you. In Matthew 24, 13, the Lord says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And that's our big idea. That's our big idea as we were focusing on that this morning, as we looked at that uh, from the very beginning. It says, our big idea, be ready. Do not be misled and endure because Christ Jesus is coming. Be ready. Be prepared. Do not be misled, that is, do not be led to wander and endure these tough times. Stand firm. The harder the going gets, the more firm we must stand. Now, in the coming weeks, we're going to continue this thread as we go on through Matthew 24. And the Lord is going to give us some specific instructions on how to be ready, how to not be misled, and how to endure. So I invite you to come back and to stay part of this teaching. Invite friends to these things as we go through this and look at the instruction that he's going to give us to understand these truths that we might be prepared, that we might not wander, and that we might endure. Because understanding these things in our day is going to prepare us, lest we be the church that goes through those days. Understanding these things in our days are going to allow us to equip the generation that's coming behind us who might be that church. Guys, it's so important to pass these truths on to our children, that they be ready to stand firm, because the church of that day will need to stand firm. I pray that God will equip us to equip them to do just that. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to your word, we've been so thankful to read from it, to learn from it, to be corrected by it. It's challenging. And those days are going to be hard and harder. May we lean on you more and more, I pray. In the days that you've given us, even these days are hard, by comparison, easy to what's coming. So Lord, in our day, help us to stand firm and to be bold, to preach as we've been told to preach. Yes, Lord, that means publicly going out. It also means talking with our neighbors. It also means talking with our family, talking with our coworkers. Wherever we are, Lord, let us be a light that shines for your glory. May you be honored by how we serve you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's stand as we worship in response.
We'll sing one song and then we'll uh, vote our new members in. commands all the hosts of heaven who else can make every king bow down who else can whisper and darkness trembles only a holy God what other beauty demands such praises other splendor outshines the sun. What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold the one and the Again, we just pray that you would receive our praises. You'd be glorified, Lord. And if anything that we heard or read out of your word, Lord, is out of step with how we see you, Lord, I just pray that you would fix that in us. You would heal us of our false expectations of who you are and how you will return, Lord, and how you will judge the nations and how you will ransom your church. Lord, I just pray for purity in our, in our beliefs and our practice and, and how we see you, Lord. You have given us your word for a reason. And I just pray that by your spirit we would rightly 
fully apply it this morning, Lord. And I just thank you for all of these saints who have gathered here to worship you. I love them, Lord, and, and we love you. So, Lord, just receive our praises. And as we gather more into the membership of, of our community, Lord, I just, we just thank you that you are growing your church always and that you have faithful people who are committing themselves to one another. We thank you, Lord. We ask that in your name. And everybody said, amen.